And everybody said, Amen. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for the depth of your word, the height of the word, and the impact your word makes on every heart. We pray, Lord, that tonight, as the seed of the word is sown in the heart, we pray it will bring forth fruit, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold, in Jesus' name. We pray that we will not be people who are always learning and yet never come in to the knowledge and the experience of the truth. We pray that your word will bear the fruit of salvation and the fruit of transformation of life and the fruit of sanctification and holiness and the power of the Holy Ghost in every life in Jesus' name. We pray that your word will drive darkness away and grant us the light of the word and the light of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to so live that our light will shine everywhere we go and the people who see us, the people who know us, they will know that we are being with the Lord Jesus and they'll give the glory unto the Lord. Confirm your word in every life tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said at headquarters, say amen. amen. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Daniel tonight. And we're coming to some selected verses of chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. It says, And the king spake unto us, Penas, the master of, of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes and then he says in verse 4 he tells us children in whom was no blemish now this was an earthly king a babylonian king and he was asking for people that will stand before him and the people that will stand around him and walk for him and walk with him and he wanted children in whom is no blemish now if an earthly king would desire I will demand that the people that will serve him, that there will be people without any blemish, I by the God of heaven, I by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He wants people that are saved and that are cleansed from their old living in sin. He wants people in heart, in mind, in spirit, in soul, in their hand, external and internal. The people, the children in whom there will be no blemishes say but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning clever and uh, in knowledge and understanding and in the science and such as at ability in them ability in them to stand before the kings in the palace if a human king if an earthly king would desire that the people who serve him that they will be people of skill there will be people who have ability and the people that bring their skill and their ability and the best of what they have to his service. How much more the Lord God of heaven. So if you are a child of God and you stand before God and you represent the Lord and you represent the gospel to your world, here is what you need to have. You need to have the knowledge and you have to have the understanding and then you should be able to have the ability to stand in the king's palace whom they might teach somebody teachable somebody who can hear the word of God understand what he's hearing and live by what he's hearing who we might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. It tells us in verse 5, it says in verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. Three years, they were not allowed to be absent, to come today and not come tomorrow. I didn't understand what they taught last week and be 
because of that. I'm, I'm absenting myself. You cannot do that if you're a real child of the king. And if you're a real trainee in the king's school, here is what you have to do. You need to present yourself every time. And then it says to nourishing them three years that at the end thereof, they might stand before the king understand when they chose them, when they selected them, they should have had the skill and the ability to stand before the king. But now, that initial standing is not enough. They will train them again and teach them more and transform them more until now they have the real train, the ability to stand before the king. Now we're looking at verse 8, in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself or the portion of the king's meat nor waste the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself we're looking at verse 17 at the end of the training at the end of the course at the end of everything the learning that they had gone through they needed a day of reckoning a day of examination at the at the end of our pilgrimage here at the end of learning the word at the end of working for the lord there's going to be a day of reckoning there's going to be a day of examination all that were learned how did we retain them all that were learned how did we what did we do with them and so in verse 17 as for these four children that's daniel shadrach meshach and abednego god gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom and daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams what's telling us here is that yes they had a curriculum at school in their training that all those people taught them but then daniel did not only depend upon the knowledge that they taught them in that training school he took time to be with god and to stay with god and to listen to god as for these four children daniel shedat meshach and abednego god gave them knowledge that's higher knowledge that's a different kind of knowledge. that's spiritual knowledge beyond what the babylonians taught them and then it says in all learning and wisdom and daniel arch understanding in all visions and dreams look at verse 20 in verse 20 it tells us and in all matters of wisdom and knowledge that the king inquired of them he found them these four he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his reign you look at the whole extent of the empire the babylonian empire and look at all the provinces that were there they could not find anyone in the whole of babylon to match the knowledge and to match the understanding and to match the wisdom of daniel shadrach meshach and abednego look at now uh, we're looking at uh, hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 and the reason we're looking at this is because of the topic we have tonight becoming better under the teaching of our king babylon at their king and Nebuchadnezzar was the king and they learned all that knowledge and they became better than all the rest of the people in the training of that king now we have our king who is greater than daniel greater than Nebuchadnezzar greater than even angels greater than all men on earth put together and we come to his school and he says come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest and learn of me. We come to learn in the school of the king. We come to learn under the teaching of our master, our Lord, our king, becoming better 
under the teaching of our king. Let's look at our king here in Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, if Daniel could learn everything he ought to learn under the school of that king, I about us now as we come to learn under the master, the messiah, the savior, the redeemer, the king of kings, and the lord of laws, we must become better under the teaching of our king. More than we were last year, more than we were a decade ago, and more than we were in the past, more than we were among our peers, among our colleagues, more than we were in the past, and more than we were even among the people. Now you understand, Daniel, even though it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar that was uh, kind of testing him, asking questions, and then he found them ten times better than the magicians, than the astrologers. I want to let, let you know Daniel was much, much better than Nebuchadnezzar himself. How do we know that? Look at chapter 2. He dreamt and he forgot. And he so got angry that he said, I'm going to kill all those magicians, all those astrologers. He said, go and kill them all. And then Daniel had about it. He also was to be killed. He was not fidgeting like Nebuchadnezzar. He was better, greater in his composture, in his calmness, in his coolness, and in his understanding than Nebuchadnezzar himself. And he went to the king and said, give me time. I'll come back and tell you that thing you have forgotten. You forgot your own dream. I'll dig it out for you. That man was better than Nebuchadnezzar himself. And I pray that as we read the word, as we study the word, and as we get deep into what the revelation of the Lord is this year, you become so much better. Ten times better than what you were before and all the people around you you have become better in jesus name we're looking at this under three perspectives look at number one number one is the experiential knowledge that makes us better than the worldly wise there are people who are worldly wise they are wise in their psychology in their philosophy they are wise in their political uh, maneuvering but when you have the word of god the mind of christ the experience and the knowledge of the lord, lord it makes you have experiential knowledge and that makes you better than the worldly wise number two is the essential wisdom there are some kinds of wisdom that are not essential we can do without them we don't even need them because of much of that wisdom does not prepare us for heaven but there is essential knowledge that maintains us stronger than worldly warriors you see nebuchadnezzar was an emperor he was a warrior and he had soldiers and he used those soldiers they conquered the world a single dream of the night conquered him and so we can have the essential wisdom that Nebuchadnezzar did not have that all those Chaldeans Babylonians did not have essential wisdom that maintains us stronger than worldly warriors number three the elevated vision elevated vision you see it says god gave daniel understanding in all visions and dreams and we have the elevated visions that move us higher than worldly walkers those who are walking in the world they're only walking by the light of the sun but there's somebody else who is walking by the light of the word of god by the light of christ jesus is the light of the world and that light is higher and greater and brighter than all the lights you get from the sun and here is the limited vision we have that moves us higher than worldly walkers 
workers and workers. We're looking at number one. Number one is the expression knowledge that makes us better than the worldly wise. We're looking at Joshua verse 17 there in Daniel chapter 1 verse 17. As for these four children, God give them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom and Daniel and understanding in all visions and dreams. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the personal experience through the knowledge of our Lord, the King. Personal experience. Not just that we're here, it goes in one ear and goes out the other ear. Not that we hear and it goes in the head and is touched in the head. And the time we're to use that knowledge to live a better life and to do a better thing. That knowledge does not come readily to us. We're forgotten. But the kind of experience we have through the knowledge of our Lord, the King. Number two, in the purifying exchange in his knowledge and liberation by the king. The knowledge we have is what liberates us. Like breaks us from external sins, like breaks us from uh, depraved uh, depravity, the inner sin, uh, that like breaks us from anything that is evil. You understand knowledge? I can go back to university and continue learning mathematics. The mathematics will not change my action, will not change my relationship, will not teach me morals, will not tell me how to live, to make heaven. You can go back to university and study chemistry and physics and history and political science. All those things cannot change your life, but it's a kind of knowledge you have that we exchange our ignorance with his inspiration and he gives us his knowledge and that knowledge makes us to live in such a way that we get to heaven eventually the purifying exchange in his knowledge and liberation by the king number three the powerful endowment through the knowledge and lordship of the king the, the powerful endowment that we have uh, have you known people that have the knowledge of the things in the world and they go to the pinnacle of knowledge and yet in their lives they do not have the power the boldness and the fearlessness to live according to their conviction but when we have the knowledge of the lord and we exchange our ignorance with his perfect knowledge it gives us a mighty strengthening powerful endowment through that knowledge and the lordship of the king we're coming to number one here number one is the personal experience through the knowledge of our lord the king well, looking at Proverbs chapter 19 verse 2. Proverbs chapter 19 and we're looking at verse 2 also that the soul be without knowledge it's not good. That the soul be without the knowledge of God's demand not good. That the soul be without the knowledge of salvation. He lives in this world. He spends all his time in this world. He does not have the knowledge of getting to heaven when he dies. That's not good. That his soul lives in this world. He does not have the knowledge of holiness. And yet without that holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That's not good. That a man lives in this world, he does not have the knowledge of the requirements of God. That this is the way, walk ye therein. He does not have that knowledge of the way of salvation, of the way to heaven, of the way to live a happy life after death. For his soul to be without knowledge, that essential experiential knowledge, that is not good. It is not good, and it says he that his death with his feet sinneth. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 77. Luke chapter 1, verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation 
That's the knowledge we're talking about. It's the knowledge we experience. It's the knowledge that we go to God and receive that knowledge from the Lord and our lives are transformed to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Verse 78, in verse 78, he says, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. The knowledge we have that makes us to position ourselves and condition ourselves and present ourselves that the Almighty will visit us with his own experience knowledge. It says that the day spring from on high has visited us. Look at verse 79. In verse 79, to give a light to them that sit in darkness. Tell me, show me any kind of knowledge in any college any kind of knowledge in any university, any kind of knowledge in any institution that gives light to those that sit in darkness. None. In the knowledge of Christ the Savior, in the knowledge of Christ the Redeemer, in the knowledge of Christ that comes to our lives, the knowledge we have, I go to Him convicted, I go to Him confessing, I go to Him praying. I go to him believing. And then he transforms my life. He converts my life. To, he says to give light to them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet to the way of peace. To guide our feet, the knowledge we have, it is, if it is knowledge from God that we have, it will guide our feet in the way of peace. Look at second Second Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3 here. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, According as his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge. He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, whereby through that knowledge, the knowledge of Christ the King, Christ the Messiah, Christ our Savior, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature, not the Adamic nature, not the depraved nature, is the knowledge we have in Christ that takes all that depravity away, that takes all that uh, sinfulness away, that takes the inner, innate weakness away, and then he gives us now the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. The knowledge of Christ coming to us will make us escape, will make us to be liberated from the corruption that is in the world. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the purifying exchange. It is knowledge and liberation as our king. He is our king. And then we we'll come to him, the knowledge we have greater than all the knowledge they were teaching in Babylon by the Chaldeans. This knowledge makes us have an exchange that he gives us his knowledge and Christ has all the knowledge. The knowledge of time and of eternity and the knowledge of the way into the kingdom of God. He gives us that knowledge when we come to him and we say, Lord, I'm ignorant. What do I know? What do I know about heaven? What do I know about the desire of God. What do I know about the power to live in newness of life? You are the one that knows I am ignorant and then we give him our ignorance and we get his knowledge that exchange purifies our lives. And it is the knowledge of heaven and the knowledge of God that brings the purity and makes us live from the inside, the way of the world to live, we are liberated by the power of the king. Look at Acts chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 13. Acts 
chapter 4, we're looking at verse 13. It says, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. That's what I was telling you. They were ignorant men naturally, but now they are being with Jesus and they had exchanged that ignorance they had with the knowledge of Christ. It says they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They took knowledge of them that, uh, look at this, this is a Jew now, and we know how the Jews are, and we know the kind of fear and timidity they ought to have. Look at that, that's Peter. And that Peter, just a few days ago, not up to maybe three months now, and when he made asked him, are you one of them? He said, no, I'm not one of them. Another one asked again, he was timid. He was fearful, but now Christ rose again. And Christ confronted him. Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Yes, you know, I love you, and I have the knowledge you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. But there's something missing inside me. And when he got that thing, the Holy Ghost came upon him and brought the knowledge of heaven into him. Now, the oldness church, and they beheld them, they studied them, and they said, These have been with Christ, with Jesus. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now, here is where we say this, what we say, here is where the robber meets the road. Here is where we're going to see whether that knowledge is only knowledge in the head or is knowledge in the heart. Whether that knowledge they had could be kind of uh, hidden or buried by the action of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all, no teach in the name of Jesus. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's right. They had seen something. They had heard something. They had heard the teaching of Christ. They had seen the resurrection of Christ. And that had worked mightily in their heart. And because of that now, they were able to stand. You will stand. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Nothing jolted the early believers. They had the knowledge of Christ. Because they had the knowledge of Christ, it says, thanks be unto God, that always, always, always makes us, causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savor of his knowledge. The savor of his knowledge by us in every place, anywhere we find ourselves, whatever wind may be blowing there, whatever confusion may be there, we have exchanged our timidity for his strength. We have exchanged our ignorance for his inspiration. We have exchanged our past for his uh, propitiation. And because he's done that for us, now he causes us always to triumph. In James chapter 3, we're looking at verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13, who is wise, who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you who is wise among you you've been to calvary 
you've been to the cross, you've been to Christ, you've knelt there, you've surrendered there, you've submitted yourself there, you've cried unto the Lord there, oh Lord, the way my life has been, I've not been demonstrated that experiential knowledge. I don't want to live again in this world with that kind of timidity of the past. I want that knowledge who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you let him show out of a good conversation manner of life his works with meekness of wisdom we're coming to number three number three here is the powerful endowment through the knowledge and the lordship of the king it says in Luke chapter 24 reading from verse 49 it says behold I your master I your teacher, I, your shepherd, I, your savior, I, your sanctifier, I sent the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. And I have to ask myself, have I tarried as he said I should tarry? Have I prayed, as, I, as you said, I should pray? We have the knowledge, no doubt. If I were to ask any of us here, do you know anything called the baptism in the Holy Ghost? Say, yes, I know. Where do you find that? It's in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. It's in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. It's in Luke uh, chapter 24 and verse uh, 40, uh, 49. It's in John chapter 7. It's in verse 37, 38, 10. You can tell me what the verses are now. That's not experiential knowledge. That's ability to read and then to remember what you read as the experience, experiential knowledge of the power the baptism in the Holy Ghost has that power been given to you. Have you tarried? Have you waited? Have you prayed? Have you consecrated? Have you said, I know the importance of this power, the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and I will pray, I will tarry, I have the conviction, this is what I need to be successful in my Christian life. To overcome every temptation and to be able to detect that that's what the devil is trying to do. He's trying to make a trap for me. And I want to have the Holy Ghost that will show me that's a trap. And to be able to overcome every time. Have you had that conviction that drove you to your knees and to say, I am saved. I'm sanctified. I must be baptized in the Holy Ghost. That the knowledge we're talking about is the knowledge that turns to experience in our lives otherwise it will be hedge knowledge and we will not have the power that we ought to have it says over here behold I send the, the promise of my father upon you but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high we're looking at Isaiah chapter 40 and I'm reading from verse 29. It says, he giveth power. He's still giving the power today. He gave in the past. He's still giving a present. And he continues to give for the people that have the knowledge, that have the conviction, that have the passion, that have the desire. I'm not going to remain as I was in the past years. I'm going to have the experiential understanding and partaking of the power of the Lord. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no understanding he increases strength. Then in verse 30 it says even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31 but they that wait upon the Lord they that wait upon the Lord that is the knowledge of the word of God from generation to generation the Lord had revealed to Isaiah many years before Christ came and when Christ came he still said you have not got this because you have not waited upon the Lord it says but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run 
and not be weary. Ah, look at that. That's why we're on a little, and then the wind is blowing contrary against our face. We're tired. We're weary. We face, you know, challenges in life, and then our running will slow down. And we face opposition, persecution, and then in our running, it's like, well, I'm trying to run, but look at this, but look at this. It's because we have not waited upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and they shall not faint in Jesus name in your life we're coming to point number two now point number two is the essential wisdom that maintains us stronger than worldly warriors look at that verse 17 again of Daniel chapter 1 Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 as for these four children Daniel Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As for these four children, hold on. All the other children too, they were not the only four that were chosen uh, that came from Judah. And all the Chaldeans too, all the Babylonians too that were chosen to be in that cause that they trained them uh, for three years. How is it that these four children uh, they made distinction in everything they have taught them and they had enough time, extra time. They managed their time that they also had spiritual knowledge that God gave them and they had time to set apart to pray. Apart from the curriculum of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians. And it says, as for these four children, you know what? We don't manage our time very well and the things we learn we don't go over them the bible study we come to we don't get the outline it's online you can get it there and then uh, come back and study it again ourselves study it to the point that we can teach other people we have the knowledge it's implanted in us it's put into us we meditate on the knowledge and then if we want now to reproduce it we can reproduce that we hear a lot we learn a lot but as for these four children they took the time they created the time they listened over again they meditated on what they learned and they had time apart to pray time apart to search the scriptures by themselves and time apart to be able to lean upon the power of the Lord. As for these four children, God gave them. Now, if you don't have time for God, he'll not have time for you. It's a relationship. If you have time for me, I have time for you. If you have time with her, your wife, she too will have time for you. But if you have hobbies and things you are looking at and this and that, and you don't have time for anyone, and nobody too will have time for you. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. We're looking at three things here. Number one is the fuller wisdom of the scriptures for believers. The fuller wisdom. The wisdom they taught them in the school of Babylon, that's not full. That's not enough. It will not take anybody to heaven. But the fuller wisdom of the scriptures for believers. Number two is the flawless wisdom of the Savior, the better one, the flawless and the faultless and the fine wisdom that the Savior had, and he is the better one, better than angels, better, better than high priests, and better than the kings of the world, and he happens to be our king. Number three, the faulty wisdom in the society of the base. All those magicians, those are base people, those who are like kind of, you know, licentious and, and sinful people, they didn't have the exalting power and the exalting character of a real believer. And there are people that go by only that wisdom. 
the faulty wisdom in the society of the base. Let's look at number one. Number one is the, is the uh, fuller wisdom of the scriptures for believers. Second Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. In Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures we might send our children to that country that country that con go and get knowledge go and get wisdom the wisdom they try to get over there if they don't read the bible if they don't continue attending church if they don't continue in the fellowship of the children of god even the little one they've got here they lose that and then over there they replace the wisdom they had before with the wisdom of the world and then we've lost those children but the full of wisdom it says that you have had you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Then in verse 17, it says that the man of God, the child of God may be perfect. That's the only wisdom, the wisdom of the scriptures that makes us perfect. Perfect. God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, walk before me and without perfect. There's no way we can do that without the knowledge of the divine and the knowledge of God himself. He says, it's the thing that will make us perfect through the foundation to all good works. The Lord do that in our lives in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 19 and we're looking at verse 7. Psalm 19 verse 7, it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You know, when you say the simple there, it means uh, actually simple turn. The simple turn. The ignorant, the dummy, the one that doesn't know how to live to please God. Simple, simple turn. But it is the watch of the Lord. It is the testimony of the Lord that is sure, making wise the simple. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Actually, that verse is being written about the king of Ty uh, the king of uh, Ty Tyros also. And, but we want to apply it to ourselves. It says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Wiser than Daniel. Wiser than Daniel. Daniel was wise. He was ten times better in wisdom than all those people in uh, the Chaldean philosophy. But now, after Daniel had lived, he knew Christ was coming. And he said, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Here is what you will do when the Messiah comes. But he died before the Messiah came. He was born of a virgin. He was Emmanuel, God with us. All his miracles and healings and deliverances, Daniel did not see that, did not know that. And to pray in the name of Jesus, Daniel did not know all that. And to have the heart that is given to us from God by the knowledge of the Lord himself. And to grant us the divine nature. Yes, he was righteous. Yes, he was holy. But Daniel did not know that promise. And then to have the power and the, of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in another language. Daniel did not know all that. And to know the details of the end time. To, he knew about eschatology. I know he knew about eschatology. But to know the details, here is what will happen. Here is resurrection. Here is rapture. And here is the establishment of the 
kingdom of God and the Antichrist and when Christ will come. He didn't know all those details that we know. What I'm saying is Daniel did not have the whole Bible. We have the whole Bible and we have the teaching spirit of God and we have the teaching, uh, you know, pastor that teaches us. Daniel did not have all that. Now, look at that verse again. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. You can be wiser than Daniel because of the scriptures, because of the spirit, because of the shepherd we have and because of all the provision that is made for us. But we need time. We must give time. and must give ourselves to what is available for us so that the word of God will be fulfilled in our lives. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from me. We're coming to number two here. Number two is the flawless wisdom of the Savior the better one. We're looking at Colossians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse we're reading from verse 3. It says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's talking about Christ, our own Savior, who says whatever we ask him, he will give us. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he will give him your brain at no more. Let him ask in faith. It says in Christ, in our Savior in our Redeemer in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and then in verse 9 in verse 9 it says for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily then in verse 10 in verse 10 it says and ye are complete in him you come to him and everything he paid for on the cross of Calvary available salvation available sanctification available steadfastness available strength available spirit baptism available knowledge available vision available passion available and conviction available everything it was can be replicated reproduced in you he that believeth in me the works I do he shall do and greater works than this shall he do because I go to the father and if he will ask anything in my name I will do it. Look at that. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And they were told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 24. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 24, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. He says, I stand at the door and I know if anyone opens his heart, I will come in, I will sup with him, I will fellowship with him, I will teach him, I will transform him. And he is the wisdom of God. And we have the opportunity that Christ can dwell in us, in all wisdom. Look at verse 30 there. In verse 30, he says, But of him are ye in Christ. Christ Jesus. He is in us and we are him. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us. Who in God Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I pray his wisdom will fill us up in Jesus name. Look at number three here. Number three we're looking at the faulty wisdom in the society of the base. We're looking at James chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 14. James chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 14 but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Verse 15, it says this wisdom Wisdom that makes us bitter, wisdom that generates hatred, wisdom 
that gives a frowning face, wisdom that brings animosity against somebody, wisdom that makes somebody uh, conspire with other people that will, will hurt him, will, will destroy him. That kind of wisdom, this wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. And you know, the devil. And Jesus cannot dwell in the same heart at the same time. Somebody that has envy and jealousy and hatred and evil. And he says, he says he's got wisdom. It's the wisdom of the world. You read in the papers the kind of wisdom that will try to hurt that man. He said what I didn't like. He did what I didn't like. It's going the direction I don't like. And therefore, I'll use wisdom to stop him. I'll use wisdom to crush him. I'll use wisdom to distract and derail him. That wisdom, my friend, is devilish, essential, and it is earthly. And you cannot have devilish wisdom and Christ's wisdom in the same heart at the same time. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish now. If somebody goes through life, you see the kind of wisdom that the devil gave him, and he's progressing in that, and he's improving on that, and he says it's wisdom. And, what, and people know me that I have a kind of wisdom. Yes or no? But if you use that wisdom of the devil all through your life and you die, you see the wisdom of the devil all through your life, where do you spend eternity? Because the people that follow Satan and the people that work for the devil and the people that have the weapon of the devil in their hands and they use that in the work of God and they use that in their Christian life and it's all a devilish wisdom if they die they will spend eternity with the one who gave them that wisdom to live they cannot live with Christ because they didn't have they could have had it but they didn't have they didn't have it and they didn't accept it they could have had the wisdom of God but they will not accept the wisdom of God they'll rather rather they enjoy that they enjoy they develop it and they go along with it and they feel they can have their way if they use the wisdom of the devil maybe you can have your way but you will not get to heaven you will go to the same place the devil will go because you are using the wisdom of the devil i pray god will deliver us i need a good amen, amen. You know, I think when I say something that strikes you, instead of repenting, then when I now demand for an amen, you give me a floppy, flat amen because you don't want to leave that wisdom of the devil. That wisdom of the devil will not continue with you in Jesus' name. Look at, look at verse 16 here. In verse 16 it says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But in verse 17, in verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. We're looking at Job chapter 28. Job chapter 28, and I'm reading from verse 12. In Job chapter 28, reading from verse 12, but where? shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding i want that wisdom and i want uh, the wisdom of god to operate in my life every moment and every time but where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding verse 13 in verse 13 man knoweth not the price thereof neither is it found in the land of 
of the living. Verse 14, it says, the dead says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. In verse 15, it says, it cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be wage for the price thereof. Where do I find it? I want that wisdom. Let's look at verse 28. In verse 28, and unto them, unto man, he says, Behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom. Gold and silver, money will not give us that wisdom, but the fear of the Lord. I don't want to spend eternity away from the Heavenly Father. I want to spend eternity with the God of heaven. I want to live a peaceful life here, a pure life here, a powerful life, here, an overcoming life here, so that when I die, or when the rapture happens, I will be with God in heaven. It needs wisdom, but that wisdom cannot be found in the sea, in the ocean, in the air, anywhere and cannot be found in the libraries and the encyclopedias of the world. Here is wisdom. It says the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. We're coming to point number three. In point number three, the elevated vision that moves us higher than worldly workers and workers. We're coming to chapter uh, 1 of Daniel. In chapter 1 of Daniel, uh, that is verse 17, as for these four children singled out, distinct, different. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams visions and dreams look at verse 20 in verse 20 it tells us and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them he found them 10 times better i'm thinking of you 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. The elevated vision that moves us higher than worldly workers or workers. In verse, look at three things here. Three things. Number one, the profitable vision and dream for spirit-filled saints. Number two, the perverting vanity of dreamers among sightless seekers. The people who are seeking for vision, for dream, for knowledge, for secret things, but they are sightless seekers. They're seeking, but they don't have any sight to even distinguish and differentiate between a kind of revelation coming from the devil or the one coming from God. Number three, the permanent virtue of his doctrine for sincere souls. Sincere souls. Sincere souls are saved souls. Sincere souls are the people that seek God and they are sanctified souls. Sincere souls are steadfast souls. Sincere souls are submissive souls and they surrender everything to the Lord and no way, no time do they take what they have surrendered to the Lord, take it back and they use it selfishly, never. And those are the people that have the permanent virtue of his doctrine. They are sincere saved, sanctified, steadfast, submissive, surrendered souls. We're looking at number one. Number one, the profitable visions and dreams uh, for spirit-filled saints. We've read, in, um, we've read in Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 that Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. What kind of vision? Eschatological 
vision, eschatological dream. It's not the dream about, you know, telling somebody, I uh, see you, you will have this. No, no, not that one. Those are kind of uh, mundane things. But eschatological visions. Look at this, Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. What secret? That's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten. And he's talking about world powers. He's talking about worldly, he's coming about gentile kingdoms. That this one will reign, you are the head of gold, and then the Middle Persian people, they had the chest and the arms of, a, of a silver, and then the other part, they had the arm and they had the kingdom of the Grecian people, and then the Romans had to come with the two legs and the ten toes. It's the eschatological vision that he had. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be be in the latter days. That's the kind of vision and dream that God gave Daniel to be able to see and to interpret and to be able to pass on to the king and to all the other people the things of the latter days. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed that what should come to pass hereafter what shall come to pass in the last days is eschatological vision and dream it's not all the dream that you know people are peddling and then somebody has a book of dreams how to interpret this if you see river in your dream if you fly in your dream if you eat in your no 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 that kind of thing this one is eschatology look at verse 45 in verse 45 it says for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out by of the hand of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron the brass the clay the silver and the gold the great god has made known unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall come to pass hereafter. That's the kind of vision that God gave Daniel and the kind of dream that he made him to interpret. It's not the, you know, the only superficial things because of what you are thinking about during the day and the activities of the day and then you now see that I have a dream, I have a dream. You can keep that one. This one is about the hereafter and the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. I pray God will help us to have the right kind of vision in Jesus' name. That, that amen is very good now. Look at point number two. Point number two here is the perverting vanity of dreamers among sightless seekers. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and the sign and the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after all the gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says thou shalt not hearken unto the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proves you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul soul. Then in verse 4 it says, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve and cleave 
unto him. You will not go after those uh, dreams and visions that make people go astray in Jesus' name. We're looking at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 16. In Jeremiah chapter 23, we're reading here from verse 16. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, hacking not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you they make you vain and they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the lord you see all those people that come with vision and dream and all that and prophecy they're prophesying about what will happen next month in our country they're prophesying about what will happen in march and what will happen in may and everybody they are running after them they say ah, that man has not spoken and then the pastor of deeper life uh, to start with um, I don't uh, want you to continue calling me you know we're in Bible study and they're calling convener of GCK I am the general superintendent of deeper life I'm not uh, you know I'm not uh, you know convener 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 I teach the word crusade is good evangelism that's good that's part of my calling evangelism but when we divert everybody's attention to convener of GCK, teacher of deeper life, and the pastor of deeper life Bible church. That's who I am. Am I right? Uh -huh. So let's. Uh, Oh, thank you. God bless you. Let our moderator stop all that convener, convener. And if you come here to make any announcement, convener, uh, that's that's enough. That's enough. The teacher, the pastor, the preacher of deep life Bible church. And then our young people, let me do everything at the same time. Biggest daddy, sugar daddy. Let's stop all that. Let's stop the biggest daddy, biggest daddy. Yeah, that means there's a biggest daddy, there's a bigger daddy, there's a big daddy, there's a small, uh -uh. No, let's stop all that. The pastor, I'm your pastor, I'm your father in the Lord. That, that's scriptural, that's Bible. When we say our father in the Lord, then you will remind yourself you are a son in the Lord and you are a daughter in the Lord. So let's cancel completely biggest daddy. Let's cancel, convener, conven yes, I'm convener of GCK when we get to the crusade. But now, we are, are you at the crusade tonight? Where are we tonight? Bible study, the teacher. Now, we come to the very fact that there are people that have perverted dreams and they pervert the understanding and they pervert the teaching of the word of God. Look at uh, that Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 21. In verse 21, it says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they run. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. Look at verse 22 there. In verse 22, but if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their way and from their evil, from the evil of their doings. Look at verse 28. In verse 28 it says, the prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. But, and the one, he that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is chaff to the wheat? The dream chaff. The visions of those people, chaff. The prophecies of those people, chaff. What is chaff to the wheat, says the Lord. In verse 29, in verse 29 it says, It's not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like as a hammer that breaketh the rocks in pieces. I pray God will give us understanding. We're coming to number three here. Number three is the permanent permanent virtue of his doctrine for sincere, saved, sanctified, steadfast, strengthened souls. We're coming to uh, second, first Timothy chapter 4. In first Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 13. First Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 13. It says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 
give attention to exhortation, to reading, and to doctrine. And then in verse, in verse 16, in verse 16, it then tells us, in verse 16, it says, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Don't allow dreams to swallow up doctrine. Don't allow human vision, prophetic vision to swallow up doctrine. Don't allow anything, principles or practices in the nation or in the church or in the denominations or in the ecumenical circles. Don't allow any tradition to swallow up the doctrine of the word of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If we cover that up and we're not trading in uh, dreams some vision nobody has been born again and then don't forget without holiness no man shall see the lord if we cover that up and then we're following after visions and dreams and things that do not profit where are we going to spend eternity and don't forget one man one wife until death do us part if we forget that doctrine and we're just you know going about now and you know merry merry, merry making and all that where are we going to spend eternity and we shouldn't forget going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We must remember the doctrines of the word of God. And then he says, Behold, I come quickly. And blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment. Let the see shame and he walks in nakedness. We must understand that the doctrine of the word of God is uh, virtuous and it makes us virtuous in the Lord. And dreams and revelations will not cover up, will not cancel the doctrine of the word of God. It says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Continue in them. And for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Somebody shout, Amen. Second John chapter 1, we're reading from verse 9. In Second John, that's the epistle of John, the second epistle. We're looking at Second John chapter 1 verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. No matter who. He has vision, but he transgresses. He abides not in the doctrine of Christ. He has not God. He writes a book of dreams. And he publicizes on the social media the visions and the dreams. But if he transgresses, if he sins against the watch of the Lord, if he transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. In verse 10, it says in verse 10, If there come any unto you, and bringeth not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, and neither bid him God's speech, Verse 11. When you sit and bid him God's speech, there are people that, you know, they have a dream. They put it in a particular way. They have a vision. They put it in a particular way. They send it to all their contacts on their phone. And then they say that this is from God. Look at it. It doesn't have anything about salvation, about holiness about purity of life. It doesn't have anything about how to be ready, as Jesus said, be ready for the coming of the Lord. And it says, remember Lord's wife. It doesn't have anything like that, only dream and revelation and vision. And it says 10 days to at least 10 people. And he said, God said, if you don't send this, then whatever happens to you is in your hand. Because God said, this sin I've sent it to you, and I'll send it to other, send it to other people. And then you become afraid of that because you don't have the fear of the Lord. You don't have the wisdom of God. And all you are walking about now, and these people can dribble you here and there. Send this, send this, send this. And then you're busy sending and sending. If you have been doing that, you have to stop that. Because it says, he that bided them God's speech promotes them. 
encourages them and is spreading their vision and their dreams is a partaker of the evil deeds then he tells us in revelation chapter 2 revelation chapter 2 it tells us in verse 25 revelation chapter 2 verse 25 it says that which ye have already hold fast till i come the salvation you have hold fast till i come the sanctification you have hold fast till i come and the pure sound doctrine that you have hold fast till i come earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints hold that fast till he comes in verse 26 it tells us it says he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end not being diverted now dreams and vision prophecy and sending this and sending that and you know those things that people are you know sharing around he that overcometh the temptation to, to agree with those uh, false prophets and the people, ignorant people that are sending for only vision and dream now and the word of God is missing in their lives but you overcome that trial you overcome that temptation he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations and verse 27 it says and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father verse 28 it says and i will give him the morning star are you the person He'll give you the morning star. And then in verse 29 it says he that has an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The Lord has spoken to us today and praise the Lord. You have ears to hear. And praise the Lord. You are going to be obedient to every word of God you have heard in Jesus' name. Why don't you stand up and pray for the grace of God and for the strength of the Lord that you will be a sincere soul, a saved soul, a sanctified soul, a steadfast soul, so that... The word of God will profit you in your life in Jesus' name.